Welcome to Health Talk. I'm Dr. Manny. It was an 18th century hospital that cared for both presidents and the poor. Today, Bellevue is a New York institution steeped in history and medical innovation. Joining me now is David Oshinsky, Pulitzer Prize historian and professor and author of the book Bellevue, Three Centuries of Medicine and Mayhem in America's Most Storied Hospital. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Glad to be here. I love the book because I love the history of medicine and you know, it's so important, especially for healthcare professionals, but I think for the public in general to realize the contributions that a lot of hospitals, especially Bellevue, has made over the centuries uh, in improving uh, outcomes. But let's talk about the, how Bellevue began. Let's talk about the 18th century. Mm -hmm. What was going on then? Well, Bellevue was part of the poor house, the original poor house in New York City. And it was also a place where you sent uh, yellow fever victims, those who had to be isolated and quarantined, basically had no family to take care of them. And during major epidemics, they would simply ship these people up the East River to Bellevue, which is now on First Avenue and 30th Street, but in the 1700s was very isolated because most of the city was down by the battery. It was a public run institution always always been a public always run institution. A public institution so it became it, if the first things that it did is it dealt with the public ha hazards of the the epidemics that were breaking out in the 17th century Th that is true century. and every immigrant group um, has come through bellevue in the 18th 19th and 20th centuries the irish came uh, and they brought cholera with them uh, jews came uh, there were epidemics like typhus and tuberculosis. African Americans came up from the South. I mean, this was the people's hospital. People's Th this was the hospital that turned no one away. Now, o over the, the years, one of the cliches that uh, Bellevue sort of became identified with was the mental, uh, uh, mentally Correct. ill patients. Right. How did that turned out to be that way? Well, um, when I was a kid growing up in Queens, if I was weird, acting weird, my mother would say, Bellevue. You're heading to Bellevue. Right. Um, Bellevue always had uh, a mental ward. In the 1870s and 80s, uh, the New York World, Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper, did a series of exposés about life in the mental wards at Bellevue with a very famous female reporter named Nellie Bly. And it came out as this huge bestseller called Ten Days in a Madhouse. And it kind of stuck. Aside from the, the not only dealing with the public health issues and, of course, the, 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 the uh, mental health patients that were being taken care of, there were a lot of innovations there were. over the history of Bellevue. Let's talk about those innovations because it sure. fascinates me. Sure. Well, anesthesia actually begins in a hospital in Boston, but it's really tried out. And the great experiments are done at Bellevue Hospital. Germ theory, the notion of antiseptic medicine, really has its beginnings at Bellevue. The first ambulance services at Bellevue, the first maternity ward is at Bellevue, the first photography department, forensic medicine begins at Bellevue. Now it's got this amazing history, not only in surgery but also in public health. And because of that, I mean, Bellevue is the hospital when a cop is shot in New York City, he, he or she comes to he Bellevue. He goes to Bellevue. Uh, a fireman is overcome with smoke, it's Bellevue. Should, God forbid, the president or the pope be overcome with some sort of illness, Bellevue is the place you send him. It is that good, but it is also a public hospital, meaning that a large part of its mission is dealing with the poorest elements of society. And because of the way that Bellevue has sort of grown, uh, from this original mission that it had of being the people's hospital and all the things that it has done. What kind of influence have you seen historically to other hospitals around the country? That, that's really a, good, uh, a, a very good question. Um, what Bellevue did was to export so many of its reforms to other places. And one of the reasons was that because Bellevue saw everything, there was no disease, no affliction that didn't come through. They could basically do something about it and other hospitals would follow. And what is really extraordinary about Bellevue, even though it's the people's hospital, is that it attracts the very best physicians, always the very best researchers, because they felt it was their Christian duty to help the poor. Um, but they would see everything. And they also could experiment on what I would call uncomplaining bodies. In right. other words, they could do a lot of stuff that might be more difficult among private patients. 
Now, I, I, wanna, I want you to talk to me about the, there's a connection between Bellevue and two U.S. presidents. Yes. Tell me those stories, because they're fascinating. Well, um, the first U.S. president was James Garfield. And Garfield, as you know, was assassinated. But he didn't have to die. He was shot and, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. And the major surgeon at Bellevue, Frank Hamilton, was brought, brought down to treat him. Hamilton was old school. He was a great surgeon. He could amputate, but he was old school, which means he would take a dirty finger and stick it into your wound. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, so Garfield didn't really have to die. He didn't die of his wounds. He died of post-operative infection, infection right. which Frank Hamilton helped give right. him. So that's one connection that, that with one. the and, attending. Right. But, but if we go a little bit further, Grover Cleveland, about 15 years later, had a cancer in his mouth, and he went to, he basically his doctor was a bellevue doctor and four bellevue surgeons outfitted if you can believe it a yacht which sailed up the east river into the long island sound and they had an operating room and they operated on cleveland and successfully removed the mass but they did it with perfect antiseptic procedures everything was starched and sterilized right in other words grover cleveland actually learned from the mistakes of james garfield right and, and that, both happened at bellevue and both happened at bellevue yeah. with bellevue physicians uh, i just want to ask uh, the last question because sure. uh, uh, you say that you know every dignitary whether it's a president visiting new york or the pope um everybody th Bellevue is the place that yes. how what do they do how how uh, how are they set up are they notify and then there's a they, team they of do they're, they're, you know I mean there's obviously an ICU unit set aside for the president and right. for dignitaries and Bellevue has probably the world's most extraordinary trauma and emergency department right and that that is really why they go there but at the same time you know Bellevue treated more AIDS patients than any hospital in the right. country. And when the Ebola patient came to New York City, where did he go? Bellevue, Bellevue. Hospital. So where do you see the future for Bellevue? In it's, a, it's a tough future. Public hospitals are, right. are in trouble now. There's less money being spent on them. I think that Bellevue is so iconic. It's got such a great history, and it's got so much to teach us about human nature, human kindness, compassion, and medical research that will always be there. Well, listen, I think your book is brilliant. I hope everybody picks up a copy. It's a great read, and it's a piece of Americana history that everybody needs to know. And thank you very we, much. I thank you very much for writing it. And if you have any health topics you want to talk about, tweet me at Dr. Manny on Fox. Until next time, I'm Dr. Manny.